Welcome to the Frontier AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to our speaker for the talk today. And thank you, Brian, for inviting me. I'm honored to be here and talk about Kaposi sarcoma. And as you know, Kaposi sarcoma is one of the original AIDS-defining malignancies. And the others are non-Hodgkin lymphoma, usually diffuse large B-cell lymphoma or Burkitt lymphoma, which are actually more common in the U.S. now than Kaposi sarcoma, although Kaposi sarcoma remains a major issue in Africa. Primary central nervous system lymphoma usually occurs with people with very low CD4 counts, less than 50 and often less than 10 or 12, and then, of course, invasive cervical cancer. All of these are viral associated. You know, Kaposi sarcoma is associated with HHV8, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and primary central nervous system lymphoma, often associated with Epstein-Barr virus, and invasive cervical cancer, of course, associated with HPV. However, there are many other non-AIDS-defining malignancies that we need to be on the lookout for in our, in our patient population. And these include squamous cell carcinoma of the anus, which is about 120-fold more common in HIV-positive people, particularly in the men who have sex with men group. Hodgkin lymphoma also increased. Hepatocellular carcinoma, particularly in those with hepatitis B or hepatitis C co-infection. And lung cancer, very common cancer. It more, occurs more frequently in people living with HIV. Many other common cancers, such as breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer, are not increased in HIV-positive people compared to HIV-negative people. This is a graph that shows the number of cases of Kaposi sarcoma in the U.S. over a period of about 25 years. And what you can see is the cases, a number of cases peaked in the early 1990s, and then with the onset of highly active antiretroviral therapy, the number of cases has gone down substantially, but we still see quite a few cases of Kaposi sarcoma. If we were talking about cancer in Africa, we would not see this drop off where Kaposi sarcoma remains a major clinical problem and appears to be potentially a more aggressive disease than it is for most people here in the US. I'd like to also mention that HHV8 is a class one carcinogen. It causes Kaposi sarcoma and a number of other kinds of malignancies as well as we'll get to. So, Kaposi sarcoma is an uh, endothelial cell tumor. You can see it in the skin, and we'll see pictures of, of patient's skin. It can also involve the lymph nodes, so enlarged, hard, painless lymph nodes. It can involve the lungs in a variety of different ways, and can involve the gastrointestinal tract and cause iron deficiency anemia or symptoms. HHV8, as I mentioned, also a causative agent in Castleman disease and in a specific subtype of lymphoma called primary effusion lymphoma. And patients may have more than one of these at the same time. So you have to be thoughtful about could they have these other problems as well. So what are the symptoms? Well, the symptoms of involvement of the skin with Kaposi sar sarcoma is, is really social stigma and sometimes isolation. I have patients who say, well, I can't go to work in the bakery because everybody is staring at me. I don't like to take the bus to work anymore because everybody stares at me on the bus. So I don't want to wear short pants in the summertime. Everybody looks at my legs. So this is a serious problem for patients. When Kaposi's sarcoma involves the feet, as it often does, people can have pain when walking, and, and it dramatically limit, limits their activity. They can also have swelling of the legs, a sort of a woody lymphedema. When Kaposi sarcoma involves the lungs, the commonest symptom is dyspnea. So shortness of breath on exertion, sometimes cough, rarely hemoptysis, but progressive shortness of breath is the commonest symptom. In the gastrointestinal tract, weight loss, abdominal pain, bleeding, iron deficiency, anemia, these could be clues to gastrointestinal involvement. So when you're doing a physical exam on somebody with Kaposi sarcoma, you want to take a very careful look at the face. Look at the nose, look inside the mouth, particularly at the hard palate and the gums. 
look in the hairline. Remember that men as well as women can wear cover up, you know, so, so just be very alert to what you see on the face. Examine all the lymph node areas in the cervical area, the supraclavicular, infraclavicular, axillary, and inguinal areas and ask yourself, are the nodes enlarged? Are they hard? You know, that could be a, a clue to uh, nodal involvement. Ask the patient to take off his or her shoes and look at both the tops and the bottoms of their feet because Kaposi's sarcoma often involves the feet, sometimes the arch of the foot, and this may be an indication for treatment. And then look at the legs. Are they symmetric? Is there woody lymphedema? Is one leg larger than the other leg? And, and so this is a Kaposi's sarcoma-directed physical exam. And here is the first patient, a photograph of the first patient I saw with Kaposi's sarcoma in the early 1990s. And so you can see, as you look at his skin, he's got, and this was at the time of diagnosis of his HIV. You can see he's got raised lesions scattered over his trunk and arms. And if you look at them carefully, they're a deepish, purplish color. You can run your finger over them. They're raised. They're painless. And this is a classic presentation of Kaposi's sarcoma. And if you look in the mouth, be sure to look at both the hard palate and the gums. I think you can see here the gum involvement. There's a purplish lump on the lower gums anteriorly. And as you look at the hard palate, you can see to the patient's left hard palate involvement. This can be flat and purple. This is the classic appearance. It can also be exophytic. You can actually see masses in the hard palate. Now, as you look over to the right side of the patient, I think you can see that his gums are likely also involved. There's a purplish area over his gums on the right side. So be sure you look in the patient's mouth and ask the patient to show you all of the areas of their gums to see if they've got oral involvement. And here's a patient who has Kaposi sarcoma on his nose. And he's got it both on the tip of his nose and above the tip of his nose. You can see the, the purplish, flat Kaposi sarcoma lesion. So when you diagnose a patient with Kaposi sarcoma, ask yourself, what should we do? Should we do nothing and say it's a cosmetic problem, long pants, a little cover-up, there you are? Should we institute antiretroviral therapy? Should we use local radiation therapy? It is responsive to radiation therapy. Or should we give chemotherapy or some combination of the above? So think about it as what you would do. And the take-home point, I think, is that all of these patients should be started on effective antiretroviral therapy. It is the key to long-term control of Kaposi sarcoma is antiretroviral therapy. So how do we treat it? We, we work with our infectious disease colleagues or primary care physicians or our primary care providers to get the patient on antiretroviral therapy. And over about three to six months, the Kaposi sarcoma lesions will improve. Now you have to manage the patient's expectations. What happens is the Kaposi sarcoma lesions will get paler and flatter, and they'll look like a cafe au lait spot. They do not go back to the patient's skin looking 100% normal. And so you don't want to keep pushing on if you do use chemotherapy until the skin is entirely back to the way it was originally. They'll get pale and flat, but they will not completely get back to normal appearing skin. You need to be alert to the fact that some patients will experience immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome uh, after you start antiretroviral therapy. And you can see two forms of iris in people with Kaposi sarcoma. The, the Kaposi sarcoma lesions that they already have can temporarily progress. So two months down the road, the Kaposi sarcoma is worse, or they can appear to develop Kaposi sarcoma in the first two to three months of treatment with antiretroviral therapy. And we think what's going on there is they previously had subclinical Kaposi sarcoma, and this progresses and is now unmasked so people can see the previously subclinical Kaposi sarcoma. Now, you might imagine that if somebody has Kaposi sarcoma in their lungs and they're a little bit short of breath and they experience iris, 
with their Kaposi sarcoma, they could get very sick over the next two to three months. So you have to think, if they've got Kaposi sarcoma in a certain location, and if it were to progress in the next two to three months, would this be a problem for the patient? And how many people does this affect? Well, there was a study done of over 400 people with Kaposi sarcoma who started antiretroviral therapy. And several of the cohorts were in, in Africa, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and there was one European cohort. And the incidence of iris to Kaposi sarcoma in the African cohort was 20%, and it was less than 10% in the European cohort. And there were some deaths due to iris to Kaposi sarcoma in the African cohort. And so this can be a serious problem, and it's more common in people living in Africa than in the European cohort. So when would we consider chemotherapy? And so reasons to think about chemotherapy in addition to antiretroviral therapy would be the patient is very, very bothered by his or her appearance and wants action faster. If they have symptomatic foot involvement, I don't want to walk into the grocery store because my, my feet hurt so much. If they have pulmonary involvement and you're very concerned if that were to progress, they might get short of breath, end up in the ICU. If they've got gastrointestinal involvement, or if they have woody lymphedema of the leg, any of these would be reasons to consider chemotherapy in addition to antiretroviral therapy. There was a large study published recently in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in which they, they studied 400 and almost 470 patients who had Kaposi sarcoma. And this was done in the UK, and they, they studied patients, they had a prospective study starting in 1998, so in the ART era, up to the present. And they had 300 patients with early stage Kaposi sarcoma, so Kaposi sarcoma just in the skin, the lymph nodes, or minimal oral Kaposi sarcoma, and they were treated with antiretroviral therapy on its own. And then they had a group, about a third of the patients had advanced stage Kaposi sarcoma. And these were people with woody lymphedema of a leg or ulceration of the skin or extensive oral Kaposi sarcoma or gastrointestinal or pulmonary involvement. And these patients were treated with antiretroviral therapy and liposomal doxorubicin. And the outcome is that the early stage patients had an 88% 10-year survival and the advanced stage Kaposi sarcoma patients had an 81% 10-year survival. So this is very good. And 15 out of the 469 patients actually died of Kaposi sarcoma, so about 3%. So Kaposi sarcoma is something we manage. It rarely causes death in people living with HIV. It can cause death, but these days in the era of ART, very few people actually die of Kaposi sarcoma, though they can have many symptoms from it. And this is the progression-free survival curve of people with early stage, in other words, skin and minimal oral Kaposi sarcoma who were started on ART without any chemotherapy. And you see their progression-free survival was really excellent. So I'd like to also mention that we are a core site for the AIDS Malignancy Consortium clinical trials led by Dr. Harrington, also Manoj Menon, Jeff Shouten, I'm involved, David Abalafia, and Wolfrey Corey Casper. So a number of people, Kingsley Nadeau, a number of people are involved in this. And we have several currently open clinical trials, including cabozantinib for solid tumors. This is an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor with very few side effects. And we have this open for patients who have Kaposi sarcoma, and other solid tumors. We have an open protocol of infusional chemotherapy for people with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and we have an open protocol of AVD with rituximab vedotin for patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, and we have other protocols that are in the process of being open. So we are happy to talk to you about your patients or to see your patients in consultation, and certainly happy to enroll them if they're interested in one of our AIDS malignancy clinical trials. And thank you very much.